Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Temple Baptist Church Sunday School lesson for February the 28th. Yep, we are several days late. 2021. Uh, this is uh, the series as, that we started several weeks ago on spiritual disciplines. This will be the last lesson. Uh, it's uh, the title of today's lesson is Joining God's Work. And we're going to be in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Uh, now the point of this whole lesson is believers are joined, are to join God's work in both the church and the world. Now that, with that being said, <clears throat> uh, we're going to be getting into some uh, scriptures that have been, uh, let's say, contentious over the centuries in the church. There have been a lot of, a lot of uh, controversy and discussion around some of these scriptures, so uh, this lesson is actually going to be probably a little bit longer than normal because I'm going to make an effort to try to hopefully clear up some of these uh, issues uh, or at least give you some food for thought on what these uh, scriptures actually mean. So with that being said, let's pray. Father, we love you, God. We ask you, to God, to clear our hearts and minds, God, so that we can hear your Holy Spirit, we can hear your voice, God. Give us... Uh, wisdom and direction and understanding into what your word is telling us today. Pray your Holy Spirit would teach us, would encourage us, God, would strengthen us, Lord, and uh, God, just remind us who we are in Christ, Lord, and that without Christ we are absolutely nothing. So we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. So today's lesson hopefully will answer several questions that uh, the following scriptures have generated over the centuries and encourage each of us to examine our relationship with Christ as the true vine and we the branches. So uh, I'm going to try to answer the following questions in this lesson today. What does Jesus mean by the true vine when he makes that statement? Now, we'll, of course, we'll get into that when we get into the scriptures. What does it mean that some branches will be removed from the vine? Now, this is the kind of the big the big question, what does that mean? And uh, so many different groups have taken off in different tangents on that. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Well, we're going to talk a lot about that. Uh, and the third question is, what fruit is Jesus talking about? Okay, uh, when, he, when he talks about bearing fruit, what, kind, what's that, what is that fruit? And there's a lot of different uh, interpretations that we've heard or we've seen about that. And these are all legitimate questions which have been argued by the church and has even caused division. And as we discussed last week, it's God's desire that there be no schism in the, His body, the church. Uh, and there will not be if we love God and we love His church. So what we're, we're going to find out, and I'll tell you the answer to the questions before we get there, is that love is the key. Okay, love is the key. Not, uh, not human love, but God's love, agape love. Okay. So, with that, being, with that being said, I want to kind of lay the setting as I like to do. Now, as you know, and we've talked about this before, in the book of John, chapter 13 through chapter 17, all of that, all those, uh, let's see, five chapters all happen in one night or one day, okay? Jesus is speaking to his disciples, all those things that he says in all those chapters. So, I encourage you to go back and read those through all the way through. And while you're at it, you might want to take a look at some scriptures in Matthew, Mark, and Luke because there's a lot of things that he said during that time frame that may not necessarily be uh, listed in John, okay? So looking at everything that Jesus tried to communicate to his disciples the last night that he spent with them, that's the point, okay? Jesus is giving out information as fast as he can because he knows he doesn't have any more time with his disciples. That that night, very night, he's going to be betrayed and he's going to be uh, taken for judgment and then eventually to the cross. So he knows he has a limited amount of time to pour out everything he can to his disciples. So that's basically the setting. Uh, so let's get into this in, verse, in uh, John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. The, in verse 1, he says, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Now, if Jesus is the true vine, then there must be vines that are false, right? I mean, why would he say I'm the true vine if, uh, if, there's, if he's the only vine, right? So there must be other vines that are false. Otherwise, why would he even make this comment? And the scripture, 
since the scripture is always the best commentary on itself, let's look at the let's look at some scriptures in the Old Testament. Now I want to look at Isaiah chapter 5, and I'm going to read this to you and then just talk a little bit about it. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. It says, Now will I sing to my well beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well beloved has a vineyard, and it's a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the middle of it and also made the wine press there. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. O now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done to it? Why then... When I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. Then I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned, nor dig, but there shall come up briars and thorns, and I will also command the clouds that they rain no more upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel." and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but all he found was oppression. He looked for righteousness, but behold, a cry. You see, here in Isaiah, Isaiah tells us that God has a vineyard, or had a vineyard, and he planted it with the very best vine, and he removed the stones and watered and built a hedge about it. He did everything necessary for the vine to bring forth fruit, but it brought forth wild grapes. So because the vineyard didn't bring forth the fruit intended, God tore down the hedge and let the wild beasts and briars and thorns take it over. Now he tells us in verse 7 that this vineyard is the house of Israel. And God had expectations of the nation, but it didn't live up to those expectations. He looked for judgment, but found only oppression. For righteousness, but he heard only crying. God did everything possible for the nation to prosper and bring forth fruits acceptable, but they did not. The problem was not the land or the water or the preparation, but the problem was the vine. It was contaminated. It was infiltrated. It was corrupted, such that it could only produce wild grapes that were not suitable for anything but to be destroyed. You can't make wine with it. The vine wasn't suitable for any use but for making grapes. That's what it was designed for. You couldn't use it to make furniture or you build houses. It was only suitable for producing grapes. So the only answer was to destroy the vineyard and start over. And Jesus said he was the true vine, contrasting himself with Israel, the false vine that was corrupted. The true vine was not corrupted. It was not infiltrated. It was not contaminated by sin. So the fruit produced by this vine will be acceptable to God. Now I want to take a look at Matthew chapter 24. And Jesus answered in verse verse 4 and 5, He said, Jesus answered them and said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So Jesus knew that after His death, burial, and resurrection, there were many would come and say, Oh, I'm Christ, or look, He's over there, or Christ is over here. He said, Don't believe them. Don't believe them. They're going to come and declare that they are the real Messiah, the Savior of Israel. And they're going to offer things. These these false prophets, these uh, uh, false messiahs are going to offer, they're going to tell you, I can free you from slavery, I can make you wealthy, uh, I can give you equality, I can give you justice. But the one thing they can't give you is eternal life. Okay, the one thing they can't give you or promise you is eternal life. This is the only thing that, uh, that only Jesus can offer because he's the only one that paid for it. He paid for it with his pride, with his life. He came to earth, he took upon himself humanity to pay the price for humanity. He suffered just like we suffer. He hungered and he was thirsty and he was mocked and he was ridiculed. He was even put to death, but not for himself or something that he did wrong, but for our sins he suffered. So he could redeem us from the one who owned us, the devil. Jesus goes on to say, my father, in uh, in verse 1 of chapter 15, back to that, 
He says, I'm the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. When Jesus says his father is the husbandman, this is a contrast to the false vines because they don't have anyone to tend them. They may produce some type of fruit, but it will eventually fail because they have no husbandman to, to tend them. But the father is the husbandman. He's the owner of the field in which the vine is planted. He is the one that takes care of the vine, waters, fertilizes, and prunes, etc. Now I want you to contrast the vine in this picture with the vine in, in Isaiah that we just read. In Isaiah, there was the vine was Israel, and God's intention was that Israel would produce righteousness. But Israel couldn't produce righteousness because Israel itself, you see, humanity, fallen hu humanity cannot produce the righteousness God requires. Okay? That's why Jesus had to come. So that's why Jesus said, I'm the true vine, because Jesus did produce the righteousness that God required. And if we, are, we find ourselves in Christ, if we are the, in the, the branch that's in Christ, okay, if we are part of the branches that, that is bringing forth fruit, we're going to talk about this a little more, then uh, we will produce the fruit that God has, intends. Okay? So we're going, to, we're going to get off into this, and this is where it's going to, you know, I'm going to try to explain some things that I believe what God is trying to say to us. But the, the father is the husbandman of this vine, Okay? Jesus is the vine, not Israel. The, God the Father is the, the husbandman, the owner of the field. He's the one that tends the vine. He's the one that waters and fertilizes. He's the one that, that makes sure everything is right so that this vine can produce the fruit uh, that is necessary. He even prunes it. He even cuts away the dead wood. Okay, in verse 2 it says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. So the question is, why does anyone plant a vine in a field? Why, why do we plant grapevines? Well, to get grapes, right? I mean, that's the end result. All the work is the harvest of the fruit. The whole reason to plant the vine is not just because, well, it looks pretty, you know, it's kind of a nice looking plant, you know, or it has beautiful flowers, but that it produces fruit, right? That's the whole point in planting a vineyard is to get the grapes. And so that's an important point to remember. That's the whole point. So in this verse, in verse 2, we see the vine has branches. Does the vine produce the fruit? No, the branches produce the fruit. This is a key point, so let's explore it for a moment. What is the relationship of the vine and the branch? The vine supplies everything the branch needs to produce fruit. Nutrients, water, whatever it needs. Uh, with, and without the life-giving vine, the branches will wither and die. Whether the vine can uh, live without the branch, while the vine can live without the branch, the branch cannot live without the vine. And just think about this for a moment. Each branch is expected to bear fruit, and if no fruit is produced, then that branch is removed from the vine. Now, this is where it starts getting a little sticky. And this is where much division has occurred over the centuries. Many opposing forces have set up camp around their own interpretation without being willing to yield, thus causing schisms in the body. So let's, let's look at some examples in Scripture to help us understand just what Jesus is saying to his disciples. So first, let's look at the Israelites who left Egypt. Some would estimate that there was between 2 and 6 million people that left under Moses. Let's look at what Moses said to Pharaoh. In Exodus chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and tell him that this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says, Let my people go, so that they may worship me. So, that's exactly what happened. And you remember the story that they had the... The plagues, and then finally, after the death of the firstborn of Egyptian, the Pharaoh finally relented and let the children of Israel go. And, uh, and they left out of Egypt, and most of you know the story. But the question is, how many Hebrews left? How many Hebrews left Egypt? All of them. Ha, that's kind of a joke, but all of them left. They took them all. Well, why didn't Moses just take the righteous ones? 
Why didn't Moses just say, okay, everybody that's righteous, you get over here, and everybody that's wicked, you get over there, and uh, only the righteous can come out, the wicked, you're just going to have to stay here. No, he didn't. They were all taken out. Were they all believers? No. We find out, uh, as we go through the book of Exodus, you find out they weren't all believers. They rebelled, they complained, they whined, some of them were killed. But nevertheless, see, see, we're looking at the nation, okay? We're looking at the nation. You know, even in the vineyard uh, story that we looked at in Israel, not everybody in Israel was lost. Not everybody rebelled. There were some, still some faithful people in Israel. But when God looked at Israel as the nation, they were corrupt. The nation was corrupt. Just like when God looks at the United States, he sees a corrupt nation. Does that mean everybody in the U.S. is corrupt? No. We're all Americans. But, but the nation itself is corrupt. And consequently, God's going to judge this nation. I believe that. I believe God's going to judge this nation because we have become corrupt. And we have to take that. Now, I'm kind of getting off track, but think about Daniel's, Daniel's prayer. Uh, and we looked at that uh, a couple of weeks ago. Daniel prayed, and Daniel, when he prayed, he said, God, we have been unfaithful. Now, Daniel hadn't been unfaithful, but the nation of Israel had been unfaithful. You know, we've turned our backs on you. We've rebelled. we worshiped other gods. We've done all this. Daniel didn't do that. But Daniel took that upon himself to confess it before the Lord for the nation. He interceded for the nation. See, I'm trying to get you to kind of think about when Jesus talks about being the vine, and the branches, we've got to understand how that, what that really means. In Hebrews chapter 3, let me read this to you in verse 15. It said, As it has been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day in the rebellion. For who were the ones who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was God angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? So we see in Hebrews that the people that, you know, the nation that God called my people, let them come worship me, are actually the same ones that rebelled. The same ones that rebelled. So that, so, so that begs the question that, did Jesus die on the cross only for the saved? You know? What's our message to the church? You know, I mean, how are we going to preach the gospel? Do we have to go find someone that's acceptable to be saved? You know, do we have to say, okay, I think this guy's, you know, he, he meets the qualifications, so therefore I will preach the gospel to him so that he can accept the Lord and be saved. That's not how it works. It's a whosoever will gospel. We preach to every creature. Why would we go preach to every creature if only some of them are going to be saved? Because every person has the opportunity. We have free will. We have free choice. Everyone has the opportunity to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. So everyone must hear the gospel. And they have to make their choice. It's not our job to make their choice for them. It's not our job to coerce them. It's just our job to tell them the good news, the truth. Okay. See, Jesus didn't die only for the saved. Now, there are people out there that teach this and believe this, that when Jesus died on the cross, he died only for saved people. Now, the, the price he paid will only be applied to those that accept it. Well, actually, that's wrong, too, because the price has already been applied. When Jesus died on the cross, when he was raised from the dead, it was finished. Sin was destroyed. Sin was defeated. The punishment for sin was defeated, and it was applied to everybody's account. Listen to this. Let me, I'm kind of getting off track, so I want to kind of stay focused. No, he died for all mankind. This is called reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And all things are of God, which have been reconciled unto, unto himself by Jesus Christ and has given us this ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us this same word of reconciliation. So in verse 19, it says, God was in Christ reconciling. Okay, what does that mean to reconcile? To, to, you know, to clear the record, 
okay, to pay the debt, you know, to reconcile. When you reconcile books, you're reconciling the left and the right, okay? God's on the left, we're on the right, we've got sins, God's got righteousness, and we've got to reconcile this problem. There's a problem between us, and we've got to reconcile it. Jesus is the reconciliation. He is the one that reconciles the difference between our sin debt and God's righteousness. He's the one that comes and has paid our sin debt so that we can experience the righteousness of God. So this is exactly what God is saying uh, in, in this scripture. So, but I want you to see that he's reconciling the whole world. He's reconciling the whole world. That's important to know. Everybody's sin debt's paid. And that's the shame that everybody... Your sin debt's been paid by Jesus on the cross. All you have to do is accept it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You just need to say yes to Jesus. Say yes to his payment. See, this is, this is, the, this is the truth of the gospel. But there are many out there that say, well, no, Jesus didn't die for that guy because he was lost. I mean, who are we? To, to, how can we look in a person's heart to tell whether they're susceptible to be saved or not? We don't know that. We just preach the gospel. That's God's job. You know, we're, we're, we're usurping God's authority. Let God be God, and we just be people, okay? Part of our covenant. Let's look at 1 John chapter 2. My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. This is in verse 1. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is a propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So in 1 John, we see another picture that Jesus didn't die for just our sins, the saved sins only. He died for the sins of the whole world. He paid, for the, he paid the sin debt. Every, everyone that was under this curse of sin through Adam, Jesus came at the second Adam, and he paid that debt. He had to. He had to. He had to cover everyone, see? God included us all under sin. Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter. All under sin so that he could pay the debt for all. That's the whole point. So we can see from these two verses that God used the death of Christ to reconcile, atone, redeem the world from sin debt. In God's eternal court of law, there is only one punishment for sin, death. Jesus' death on the cross paid the sin debt we all owe. Everyone. Everyone. Not just the saved. This is the good news, but also disappointing news for many that refuse to accept the payment and try to satisfy God's legal requirements on their own. We cannot have right standing with God without the shed blood of Christ applied to our sin debt. Let's look at Galatians 20, 20, uh, 2 20. Sorry. It says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now Paul makes a very bold statement here. He says he was crucified with Christ. How can this be? Was he on the cross? Did Paul climb up on the cross with Jesus? Was he saved or lost when Christ was crucified? Paul is saying not only did Christ take his place on the cross, but we, mankind, was with him or in him on the cross. Just as the nation of Israel was in the very presence of Jehovah in the temple in the person of the high priest. You remember on the Day of Atonement when the high priest went in, he, had, uh, he went in before the, uh, the Holy of Holies into the presence of God. He wore, when he ministered, he wore the ephod with the 12 stones on it for the 12 tribes of Israel. Do you remember that, th those pictures? The, that the high priest was the very representation of the nation and that we symbolically went into the presence or the Jews went into the presence of God through the high priest. He was our representative. This is exactly what, what uh, the picture that we're painted here. Jesus is our high priest and he has taken our place, but we, he hasn't just been our substitution, but we are with him and in him. It's just like we died on that cross. When God sees the blood of Jesus on us, we are, uh, his blood covers us. But it's just like we died. God sees us as having died to our sin and we made alive. And that's such, a, uh, that's such a revelation to understand that. The problem is we don't see ourselves dead. We need to see ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Okay, that's the struggle. That is the struggle. 
<clears throat> so he says, uh, and Paul was lost when, he, when, uh, when Christ was on crucified. So if, if Jesus only died for the saved, see, it doesn't really make sense. If Jesus only died for the saved, how, you know, how could Paul, Paul was lost when he made this statement that Jesus, he was in Christ, you know, that he was in Christ when Christ was crucified. So that tells me that Christ paid Paul's sin debt when Paul was lost. Uh, it, 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 maybe it's, a, it's even getting a little hard for me to follow. So, but I, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that Jesus, the, the idea that Jesus only paid for the sins of, uh, only paid for the sins of those that are saved is, is ludicrous to think that. Je, Jesus paid all the sin debt. He wiped it clean. He did away with it. Okay, sin has lost its power. It has no power. Now, that's the, that's the good news. Now, if, you, if you're not willing to accept that, sorry, there's no other option. There's no other way, you know? There's no, other, there's no plan B for you. Jesus is it, okay? He's, he is the only way. And that's what he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You're not going to get to the Father but through me. So we have to accept Jesus Christ to get to God. If we're going to get in the throne room, you've got to go through Jesus, okay? There's no other way in. <clears throat> so now we get to this point. So if, if this is true and Jesus paid for the sins of the world, why aren't all mankind saved? You know, why aren't they saved? Now, this is, that's, that's a real issue. There's a difference between having your debts paid <clears throat> and you receiving that payment yourself Okay, having your debts paid and you receiving that payment for yourself. God never violates your free will. He has done everything needed to restore your relationship with Him, but you have to choose to accept it and follow Him. See, God's not going to twist your arm and make you follow Him. <clears throat> he's, going to, he's going to lay it out there. He's going to love you. He's going to, he's going to do everything necessary to bring you to that point. He'll even allow circumstances in your life to drive you to Him, but you have to, find, you have to open the door. You have to make the choice. Okay, you have to make the decision. Okay, <clears throat> so now let's go back. We're going to go back to, the, to our lesson. Let's look at the branches that bore no fruit and were removed from the vine. So just as all mankind was on the cross in the person of Jesus Christ, our high priest, we are also in the vine. Not everyone that came out of Egypt entered into the promised land. See, I, ho I hope you're following this. There's, there's difference between Christians and Christian dumb, okay? There are many in churches today that have never accepted the free gift of salvation God offers through Christ, even though they are in the church. They are not of the church. They are not part of the bride. They just, just because you sit in a pew next to grandma and sing the hymns and throw some money in the plate doesn't make you a part of the church. So hopefully this answers the question about the branches that don't produce fruit, okay? So there are branches, there are, there are branches in the vine that are there, but don't produce any fruit. So it becomes very clear which ones of those, if you're not producing fruit, then you need to be cut out. Okay? You need to be cut out. But it goes on to say, but if a branch bears fruit, then the husbandman prunes the branch, cuts away the dead wood, cuts back to allow new growth to come out. While this process at first doesn't look pretty and seems cruel, but the end result is production of more fruit. And I kind of think about the crepe myrtles. You know, this time of year, everybody trims their crepe myrtles back, and they look like, you know, they look terrible, okay? Uh, but next year, you know, or, in the, or later on, when they start to grow back and they start to bloom, uh, they're going to be beautiful. They're going to be beautiful. And see, that's what pruning does. Pruning gets rid of the dead wood. It doesn't waste any energy. It uh, gets rid of the wood that's not producing and, uh, or that's, it's, that's causing problems, and it allows the, allows the branches to produce as much fruit as possible. The point is the purpose of the pruning is not always evident until the fruit or the blooms come out. Okay? I mean, sometimes we go through pruning with God. So, now... Let's, so we got branches that have been cut out, okay? They were never really part of the vine anyway, okay? They were, they were lost. They were the, those were the, the lost, okay? 
Now, Jesus took us all into him on the cross, everybody. But that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's going to be saved, just like God saved everybody out of Egypt. He took the whole nation of Israel out. Not all of them were saved, okay? You say, are you getting the picture now? That You say, well, how can, a, how can a branch be in the vine? If Jesus is in the vine, how can a branch be in him? We're all in Jesus. We were all in Jesus on the cross. If Paul was crucified with Jesus on the cross, then everybody was. God took all of Adam, uh, a descendant from Adam on down, he took us all into him. Now, are we, is everybody going to get saved? No. Okay, is everybody going to bear fruit? No. And the ones that don't bear fruit are going to be cast into the fire. They're going to be cut away. Okay? I mean, you can think about what John the Baptist said uh, when Jesus came on the scene, when John preached, that uh, there are going to be some that, you know, Jesus is going to come. He's going to separate the wheat from the tares. Okay? He's going to separate. So you can go through scriptures. You can find a whole lot of examples of this. I'm just sharing a few because I just want to get the, I just want to get the understanding. Uh, this does not mean that you can lose your salvation. Okay? That's not what he's saying there. It's not this at all. What he's saying is there are branches that will not produce fruit. Okay? And they have to be cut out. <clears throat> just as there are tares that are in the field. Okay? That will eventually have to be removed. From the wheat. Okay, we see pictures, all the pictures like that, all the way through. Um, so <clears throat> he goes on to say in verse three, "Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you." Yes, the word of God is the only thing that can cleanse us. Let's look at Ephesians five. It says, "Husbands love your wives." In verse twenty-five, "Husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it." that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the word of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The word of God has cleansing power when believed, applied, spoken in our lives. This is what Jesus is telling his disciples, and he's telling us. Not that not, not they are cleansed because they heard him speak, because many heard him speak and went away sorrowful, but because they believed, applied, and testified of the truth, God's word has the power to change our lives, uh, excuse me, change our filthy garments into raiment white as snow, to change a pig or a dog into a lamb, to change our eternal destiny from hell to heaven. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. Now we get back to this idea of abiding. We had a teaching on this not too long ago, so I'm not going to labor it, but notice that abiding goes both ways. <clears throat> the branch abides in the vine, and the vine abides in the branch. It's a picture of, depend of a dependent relationship, much like a marriage. If the branch is to bear fruit, then it must abide in the vine. So also, if we are to bear fruit, we must abide, live, make our home in Christ. You see, and then when we talked about abiding before, you know, I really try to drive home the point that, man, I think this is where most of us as Christians miss it because we, we just don't spend enough time in Christ. We don't really, um, we just don't spend enough time in the presence of the Lord. Uh, we don't understand you know, we think we come to church and we read our Bible every now and then, that's enough, but it's really not. I mean, if God is who he says he is, then we should be before his face at every moment of the day. At least we should be cognizant of his presence. I'm not saying that we ought to be, you know, just go up on a mountaintop. I said we all, we all have to work and we have things to do, but even in our work, we should be cognizant of God's presence in our lives and in the things that we're doing. And that will change the way we view things. I, believe, I guarantee you it will change the way you view things because you'll begin to see things through the, the way God sees them. <clears throat> okay, verse 5. I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. In verse 6 it says, If a man abides not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Well, my ego doesn't like this verse. My spirit loves it, but my ego doesn't. 
You know, it says, you know, in verse 5 it says that without Christ I can do nothing. And I'm thinking, surely I have some value. Surely I can do something. But everything that I try to do is going to be vanity if I'm doing it without Christ. Without Christ, we can do nothing. Say it with me. Without Christ, we can do nothing. We've got to get that through our heads. You can have a thousand-member church, the biggest in the convention, all kinds of buildings, and, and in the hearts uh, of special events and ministries, uh, you know, all this stuff going on. The question is what happens in those buildings and in the hearts of the people that come in those buildings or that come to those special events or involved in those ministries. If they, are, if they are done without Christ, they amount to nothing. But if Christ is in them, then they will produce fruit. Okay? Okay, so now we're talking about, we've been talking about producing fruit, producing fruit. So the third question, I think it's our third question, what, what fruit is he talking about? Okay, first we need to ask this question. Can you be a Christian and not bear fruit? According to what we read in these scriptures, the answer is no. If, if you're born again, you're going to produce fruit. There is an expectation that if, that if you are in the vine, you should produce fruit. And if you don't, you are removed and cast out. Okay? So just like Israel, God planted it. You know, in Isaiah, God planted it. You know, he watered it, he did everything possible, but they didn't bring forth fruit, acceptable fruit. They brought forth wild grapes. Completely, totally unuseful. You can't make wine out of it, you can't eat it, it's bitter, it tastes nasty, it's, you know, it's just wild grapes, you know. Maybe the animals can eat it, but, you know, it wasn't what the husbandman was expecting. So there, there are several different things that we could look at. First of all, basically three. First off, the, the, the fruit of winning souls to Christ. Now, there's some people out there say, this is what that fruit is. You know, so if you're not out there winning souls to Jesus, then you're going to be cast out of the branch. This has been preached in a lot of churches. But if we conclude that this, it, that this is true, then the branches are removed because they didn't win souls. To accept this, we have to reject many scriptures that teach salvation is by grace through faith, not by works. Okay? So basically, soul winning is a proof of, it's, a, it's evidence of a salvation experience. It's not the salvation experience within itself. Okay? So we'd, we'd have to reject tons of Scripture. I mean, actually, Old and New Testament to come to this conclusion that by, by going out there and winning souls, that's the fruit that God intended. Uh, okay? We could talk about the fruit of good works. Could this be it? If we accept this, then we run into the same problem with, winning, with soul winning. We have to reject most of the New Testament to accept anything that we can do to obtain salvation and, and that will keep us in the vine, right? I mean, is that really the fruit that God's looking for? And see, the thing, the thing is, is that all those soul winning is great, okay? The doing good works is great, but is that... You know, how can we, does, is that how we get saved? And we know that's not, you know. Uh, we're, Bible, we're a Bible-believing church, and we know that we're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves, it's a gift from God. We know that works, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we know that that's true, and there's many, many other scriptures. Uh, so the weight of the scriptures don't, won't support that. So where do we go from here? What's the fruit? So we got one last fruit to examine, and that's the fruit of the Spirit. Agape love, okay? The love of God. So I'm going to just make a, a, a declaration. I'm going to submit to you that this is the fruit that God expects us to produce. This is the fruit that the husbandman is looking for when he inspects the vine. Now I want to take a, I want to go through, we've got several scriptures to go through. Um, we're going to be in John chapter 14. We're going to be in John and 1 John. And then we're going to go to Galatians 5. But we're going to be in John chapter 14. I'm just going to read some scriptures because I want you to see the picture that Jesus is painting. Jesus answered it. Now, John 14 is right before John 15. And this is all, as I said before, all this is being said to the, to the disciples in one night, in one city. They're sitting around uh, and they're talking about all this stuff. 
And Jesus answered and said unto them, If a man love me, he will keep my commandments, or he keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And he that loves me not keeps not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. Listen to John chapter 13, verse 23. If, if a man loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And he that loves me not keeps not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. So again, we see he's, you know, he said it in John 13, he says it again in John 14. So he's driving this point home. Look at 1 John 3 through uh, 1 John 3, 14. We know we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abides in death. So then we, we, see, so we see that we know that we have passed from death into life. How do we know that? Because we love the brethren. Not, not a carnal love, not a phileo love, but an agape love, a love charity, okay, which has been d terribly diluted in our day and age, but used to be a very beautiful word, the, the word charity, you know, the, the, just, giving be, just giving because, okay, because you love, because you care, not expecting anything in return. Look at, uh, I want to read another verse, verse John 4, verses 7 through 6. 12. 1 John 4, 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knoweth God. For he loves not, he that loves not knows not God, for God is love. This was manifested that the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that he might live through, that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be, be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and His love is perfected in us. All right, I want to read the last scripture to you. Uh, Galatians uh, 5, verses uh, 22, very familiar scriptures. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, I want you to see there, that's a singular. That word fruit is singular. Okay, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love. Okay, now that spirit of love produces joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So I submit to you that based on the above scriptures and the very nature of God, that the fruit expected is the fruit of love. Agape love. If the fruit of love is not produced as we abide in the vine, then we can conclude, uh, though in the vine, we are not of the vine. If we are in the church but not producing the fruit of love, then we are not of the church, the body of Christ. Now abides faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. In verse 6, back in verse 6, somewhere back here, uh, we see the reason for not bearing fruit. What does it say? If a man abide not in me... He is cast forth as a branch. So we're not abiding in the vine. Okay, Even though the branch is attached to the vine, it doesn't accept the living, life-giving nutrients required to bring forth fruit. Similarly, even though we were in Christ on the cross and our sins have been reconciled, we have to accept the life-giving life -giving nutrients that only can, be, can produce the fruit of love which comes from abiding in Christ. Okay? It's because we're not abiding in the vine. In verse 7 it says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. So in, in today's Christianity, we are told to focus on the last part of this verse. You know, boy, we like that part. You can ask what you will and it'll be done for you. But they seem to skip over the first part. 
if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Next time you pray for something, examine whether you're abiding, living, resting in the vine and God's work uh, or abiding, living, resting in you. Is the fruit of love being produced in and through you? If so, then you can expect God to do the thing you ask because if you're abiding in God's word, then you will ask for the thing that God has already revealed to you through his word. Does that make sense? I mean, if you're, if you're walking with God and you're abiding in him and his words are abiding in you, then basically the words, the words that, the things that you ask are his words, right? If his words are abiding in you, then you're not going to ask amiss from his will. You're going to ask according to his will, and it's going to be done. Cool. Okay, last verse. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Let me read Matthew 7 to you, verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come in, uh, come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes with thorns or figs with thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. When we abide in the vine and produce the fruit of love that God is glorified, uh, then God is glorified and we will do the works that prove we are his disciples. Not works to save us, but works because we are saved. Works that flow from the love that God has put in our hearts. So in conclusion, how are we to join in God's work? That was the original uh, point of the whole lesson. How do, we, how do we join in God's work? By abiding in the vine and loving one another. You see, the word says they're going to know us by our love. They're going to know who we are. They're going to know we are Christians by our love. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you, God. We pray, Father, that you would, God, uh, as we abide in the vine, God, we want to produce the fruit that's pleasing to you, God, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of love, God, that we could truly, honestly, uh, love without uh, hypocrisy and love without dissimulation, God. We could have your love. God, and, and Lord, we can't produce that love. God, it's, got, it's a supernatural love. God, you have to produce that love through us as we die to self and get out of the way and let you live your life through us, let you produce the fruit in us, let you uh, shed abroad your love in our hearts, God, and through us. God, it's the only way. God, we need a supernatural touch. God, we need a touch from you. So God, I ask you to do that. Touch us, revive us, God, encourage us, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.